we're gonna get started with our second panel. And so, uh, first, I wanna I wanna thank you all uh, for joining us in celebrating uh, the school's anniversary in this this two-day uh, dialogue that has proven to be uh, quite interesting so far. We've heard a lot uh, in this event uh, over these two days about some of the challenges that lie ahead in the 21st century, including many dimensions of inequality in the panel that we just heard, as well as uh, the uncertainty of recent political changes. We'll hear more about these challenges later today, including the acute threat posed by climate change, as well as the, uh, the, the, the looming threat of, of conflict uh, in the horizon. Despite all of these challenges, however, or perhaps because of them in part, we often overlook uh, the real progress that we've experienced over the past few decades. Uh, the, the, the rate of poverty, for example, across uh, many different measures has steadily declined uh, and more people than ever now have access to public services. These encouraging outcomes have been the result of a number of factors, including things like economic geography, uh, technological change, smart economic policy, and, uh, and political institutions, which is something that, that uh, I like to emphasize given my own background in political science. These same factors also help to explain another reality that goes hand in hand with this uh, improved prosperity, which is that uh, this substantial progress has also been quite uneven. There are people in the developing world that have experienced a notable material improvement in their lives, uh, at the same time, middle classes in the, developing, in the developed world have seen their income stagnate. And so these this factors that I mentioned and the role in fostering or impeding prosperity as well as the distribution of this prosperity are the central focus of many of the school's research initiatives, which have helped us over the years to better understand uh, the sources of development. And so in this panel, uh, four of my colleagues uh, at the school will highlight these uh, complementary factors in the research. And so we, we will begin uh, with Professor uh, Gordon Hansen. Uh, Gordon holds the, economic uh, the Pacific Economic Cooperation Chair in International Economic Relations at UCSD, uh, where he holds faculty positions in both GPS and the Department of Economics. And he's also the director uh, in the Center on Global Transformation, as well as the co-director uh, in the Big Pixel Initiative. Gordon specializes in international trade, international migration, and economic geography. And his current research uh, uh, addresses how expanded trade with China has affected the US labor market and how US regional economies adjust to immigration. And so I think uh, th there's no better person to start, uh, start us off in this discussion about e economic prosperity than Gordon. And so I, I, I want you to join me in welcoming him uh, here. To Thank you, Francisco, uh, and welcome to you all. It's great to be here. I know this, this session is about prosperity, and I promise uh, we'll get there, but uh, the beginning is going to be a little dark. Um, we don't call it the dismal science uh, uh, for nothing. Um, so we live today in a divided nation. Uh, if you turn on the TV or go on the internet, you see that we disagree about, about culture, about politics, race, religion. Uh, you may support our president, you may oppose our president, your opinion is likely pretty firm. Uh, we're, we're a country that doesn't have a lot of middle ground. So part of where these differences have come from have been 30 years of increasing economic polarization and opportunity uh, in America. If today you live in a city like Boston, Chicago, Washington, D.C., or here in San Diego, good jobs at high wages abound. Uh, but those kind of jobs are scarce in a lot of other places in the old industrial centers of the Ohio River Valley, in inland cities like Fresno, California, uh, where I grew up, and in rural towns uh, across, uh, across America. That polarization means that the great ladder of social mobility in America, something that we pride ourselves in, in having and maintaining, that ladder has lost more than a few rungs. And let me just give you a couple data points to, to drive that, that point home. Americans born in the 1940s, had more than a 90% chance of earning more than their parents by the time they were adults. If we jump ahead just 30 years in time, Americans born in the 1970s have only 50-50 odds of besting their parents uh, in terms uh, of income. 
So understanding, diagnosing these regional disparities has been a major part of economic research over the last 25 years, and it's something to which I've devoted a, a substantial part uh, of my career. Uh, what I study is how globalization and technological change uh, have transformed the U.S. labor market. Now, freer trade globally, to be sure, has brought economic opportunity to where uh, it was most needed. Uh, uh, economic reforms and market opening in China and India have lifted hundreds of millions of people out of abject poverty. And this is one of the great accomplishments of human society over the last hundred years. In the U.S., China's rise in particular has cut two ways. So first imagine you're an engineer working at Apple in Cupertino, California. Uh, first, congratulations, you have one of the most sought after jobs uh, in America. Um, so, what, Apple, what, what China has meant for you is a supply of labor to assemble the iPhones that embody the technology you work so hard to create. As China became the world's factory, Apple's stock price soared, as did wages and housing values uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, so globalization meant dramatically increasing prosperity in tech centers around the world. Now, imagine instead you're a cabinet maker in Tennessee. Uh, it's pretty likely that China's rise cost you your job. Manufacturers of clothing, of footwear, of furniture, of other labor-intensive items simply haven't been able to compete with low-cost imports. And so the consequence has been these factories have shut their doors uh, and a way of life came to an end in America's industrial heartland. Technological change has also had momentous impacts. In particular, it's ex improved our quality of life in myriad ways. Uh, we now are connected in, in ways in which we could have never imagined. We have access to a vast variety of goods and services at lower prices uh, and at almost immediate delivery. Um, and we have prospects, real prospects, for curing diseases that have long plagued us. Like globalization, though, uh, technological change also cuts two ways. Automation has displaced workers with robots on auto assembly lines uh, in Detroit. It's reduced the need for bank tellers and for checkout clerks in cities are around the country. And it's contributed to the increase in gulf in pay between CEOs uh, and their staff. Now, complicating all of this is that Americans have become less mobile geographically. We think of ourselves as a country on the move, and indeed we have been for much of our history. But that has changed pretty dramatically in the past couple of decades. So if you, the cabinet maker, or you, the auto assembly worker, had moved to San Jose to work in tech, the loss of your factory job wouldn't have been so painful. But much more likely than not, you stayed put, as did your fellow former factory workers in cities across the Midwest and Southeast. And so what that meant was that you watched from your front porch as, as stores closed, as families faced stress and broke apart, and in the last decade, as the opioid crisis ran, uh, ran rampant. Now, also working, so what's been working against the economic mobility are a couple of things. One is just the complications of modern family life in America. Families today have multiple income earners. They often rely on parents and family members for childcare, and they often live in more than one household. Uh, it's increasingly common for children to live with one parent with the other parent residing elsewhere. What that means is if you want to get it together, you lose your job and you want to move to a new city, you've got uh, an organizational problem, a challenge that's just much greater than in the past. Also working against mobility are the unintended, uh, unintended consequences of government policy, some of which uh, um, Alex mentioned in, um, uh, in his presentation uh, a bit ago, and I'll talk more about uh, in a second. So a lot, of a lot of times it seems like what economists do is just sort of uh, catalog the challenges and the problems of modern life without telling us what we should do. Um, and indeed, that is a, a lot of what we spent uh, our time doing. But what we're doing at GPS now, uh, in concert with our partners at other universities, um, is uh, not just the fundamental research so that we understand deeply how these processes work, but we're also beginning to design practical solutions so that we can begin to make our communities more resilient and that we can begin to diminish what divides us. So I want to mention just uh, kind of three lessons that we've learned uh, along the way. Now, the first might sound kind of obvious or, or even trite, and, and that is it, but it's really important. Keeping people in work matters. It matters for human dignity. 
it matters for the dignity of families, and it matters for the dignity of, of communities. Uh, all too often, some of the policies we have in place work against maintaining tr uh, strong work incentives. Now, one of the best policies we have to promote the incentive to work is one that Alex mentioned, the earned income tax credit. But it has a big flaw. It targets its, uh, its benefits towards people who have dependents in the household. Suppose a family, because of, of, of hard times, has the mom living with the kids in one house and the dad living with the kid in another house. Um, if, the dad, if the mom's not working and the dad is, the dad only uh, 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 qualifies for about $400 in benefits. If they live together, as Alex mentioned, they can, they can get as much as $6,000 out of the system. So fixing this, uh, fixing this system would, would create a, a program that would provide strong incentives to work for low-income workers. And surprising as it might seem, it's something that Republicans and Democrats in Congress actually agree on. Uh, the value of this program and how it would be worthwhile to expand it. I know this because I've, I've talked to people on both sides of the aisle about this. Um, second, uh, we've learned that many government programs, well-intended as they might be, often fail to take local context uh, into account. Uh, worker training in particular, we spend lots of money on worker training, but we don't always verify that the skills being imparted are actually valued by local employers. So an example about how we might uh, do things differently comes from Dade County, Florida. There, community colleges are working with local employers to design degree programs that will match grads with the needs uh, of, of local business. Uh, third, uh, what we've learned is that business itself is an essential part of the social fabric of communities. Now, this highlights uh, both the societal uh, importance of business and the societal obligations of business. An example of a place uh, where those obligations are taken seriously is Columbus, Indiana, where machinery manufacturers uh, work to provide community centers, after-school programs, and better technical training uh, in high schools. So as we, we assimilate these lessons, so what we see is that if we, as communities, as government, as business, uh, as universities, as families, embrace our shared responsibilities, then we have a chance uh, to begin to renovate communities that have been hit uh, by hard times. So in closing, I want to draw uh, on um, wisdom of a philosopher who's been very important in my life, and that is Bruce Springsteen. Um, <laughs> you have to indulge me, I'm a kid of the 1970s, and I have this outsized view of the importance of rock and roll in human civilization. Um, so what Springsteen, the boss, talks about uh, in his towns, some of it, uh, in his songs, some of it is pretty bleak. Uh, it's about the hardship of life in old industrial towns in America. And in his, his, perhaps his greatest song, Born to Run, he tells us, you got to get out while you're young. But Springsteen, as he, as he ages, also implores us to cherish our hometowns, to not surrender, and to embrace, yes, what it means to be born in the USA, whether we were born here or we came here to realize our dreams. So the boss, I think, has it right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, now, it is, it is my delight to, to welcome Renee Bowen to speak to us. Renee is an associate professor of economics at the school, and she's the director of the newly formed Center for Commerce and, Dip and Diplomacy. Uh, she researches uh, political economy, macroeconomic theory, and international trade, and applies dynamic game theory to study the behavior of individuals who are constrained by institutions and who have long-term strategic considerations. Uh, before joining us uh, at UCSD, Renee was a, a professor of economics at Stanford the School of Business and has uh, worked in the private sector as well as a consultant for the World Bank and at JP Morgan Security. So, welcome, Renee. Thanks, sir. <laughs> Thanks, Francisco. So, I'm going to talk about the power of the status quo today complacency. Stuck, gridlock, entrenched, same old, same old, business as usual. Those are the words that come to mind when you hear status quo. I'm going to try to convince you in the next seven minutes that the status quo is dynamic. It's exciting. It's powerful. And it's one of the keys to understanding how to address the challenges of our time. What are some of these challenges? A 
broken world order, populism. We have challenges of prosperity, challenges of inequality. How do we design the best policies? What do we mean by best, anyway? Best for who? Are we trying to grow the entire pie at the expense of some? Some might think that's the right answer. But I like a different notion of best, something you might have heard about. It's called Pareto efficiency. What does that even mean? Well, if I can make Francisco better off without making anyone else in this room worse off, that's a Pareto improvement. I'm after Pareto improvements. I like Pareto improvements. But what does status quo have to do with Pareto improvements? We're talking about improvements. I'm a mother of two children. At any point, I would never try to take a toy from my son and give it to my daughter. I simply wouldn't do that. What kind of mother would I be? I might give my son a toy and tell my daughter, just wait your turn, be patient. Status quo doesn't matter, has no bite. I'm a benevolent mother. I would never harm my children. But this is a democracy. We don't have a benevolent mother. We have to agree to anything. We have to bargain. The status quo matters when we're bargaining. So, I'm going to use my love for theory and tell you how the status quo matters for bargaining. Imagine for a moment that there are two people balancing on a plank. Let's call one Jack. Let's call one Jill. They're standing on this plank. They'd, most, they'd both prefer to go up than go down. Up is good. Down is bad. Well, if you're Jack, you're thinking, your best bet is to get closer to the fulcrum. If you're Jill, you know what Jack's thinking. You better get closer to the fulcrum, too. Well, unfortunately, this ends up with an equilibrium where Jack and Jill are on top of each other, <laughs> right at the fulcrum. Of course, they're not going to stay like that. Jill's probably going to kick Jack off. <laughs> but that's inefficient. We can do better, quite simply. Just put two additional supports. Now, Jack and Jill don't have to fight anymore. These supports, that's the status quo. The status quo just got us to a better outcome for Jack and Jill. But you say, we're still here. Don't we want to go up? Well, now Jill's only option for going up is to get creative. Jill might choose to get a balloon and float away. Jack, that's okay. Under the old regime, Jack would have fallen. But under this, with the status quo, Jack's cool. He can stay right there if he wants to. Or he can get his own balloon. He's like, oh, I like that idea. A balloon, let me go off too. Okay. But I said it's dynamic. It helps us to move places. And I'm going to show you an example of how it helps us to move places. So let's take Jack and Jill again. Balancing on their little plank. There's another plank over here. Since they both like to go up, They'd both much prefer to be on that plank over there. But now, aha, uh -huh, Jill's a clever girl. 
Jack's a clever boy, too. <laughs> Jill says, look at this. If I somehow jump onto that plank, I'd be great if I landed just perfectly right here. But there's this risk that I land badly and somehow end up going down. Jack makes the same calculation. They say, never mind, we won't do this. Let's instead think, what if we put the supports right here? What if we design the status quo so that if Jack and Jill choose to move, they know they're balanced, they know they're supported. Now Jack and Jill together, as a clever pair, decide, let's go with that status quo. We can design the status quo. Designing the status quo is not a new idea. The Bible talks about King Solomon. There's a famous story that you might know. Two women walk in. They have a dispute over a baby. Woman A claims the baby is hers. Woman B claims the baby is hers. But woman A has the baby in her hand. It must be hers. That's the status quo. King Solomon, in his wisdom, recognizes what the women think is the status quo. He changes the status quo. He says, I'm going to split the baby in two. He provided a worse status quo. The true mother would prefer the current status quo over the worst status quo that King Solomon is offering. He designed the status quo. He designed it so that the, the true mother was revealed and the outcome was better for everyone. Okay, so we can design the status quo. Why might we want to design the status quo? It's broken. It needs to be fixed. We've been talking about that for the last two days. We've been talking about that this morning. We'll talk about that for the rest of the day. Francisco said, I'm an economist. I'm a game theorist. Unfortunately, he's wrong. I'm a civil engineer. My first degree is in engineering from MIT. I want to fix things. I want to fix the status quo. It's broken. We can fix it. We've had the international trading regime since 1947, 72 years of a status quo that was working for a time. With each successive round of negotiations, that status quo improved. But we can all agree the current status quo is not working. It's time to fix the status quo. I have work with Julia Raslan, Ying Chen, Jan Zapal that tells us the right way to fix the status quo is to, to ensure there's enough flexibility. So we will fix the status quo. What happens if we don't fix the status quo? But wait, there's one more thing. There's one more thing. Why does this all work? Who's designing the status quo? There needs to be some governance. There needs to be some leadership. But not only governance and leadership, governance and leadership that everyone subscribes to. In this country, we have a perfect example of what this is. Any program, any spending program by the United States government that's mandated by law is a status quo. It provides a status quo that's dynamic. It leads to higher provision of public goods. But why does it work in the United States? Why doesn't it seem to work in the same way in international trading regime? We respect the laws. The law works here. We cannot improve the status quo of the international trading regime without respect for the laws. That's where it needs to begin. So I hope you'll join me in optimism that we can get to this higher place with the the right design of the status quo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. It is, it is my, my pleasure to, to welcome uh, David Michael to the stage. David is a professor of practice at the school, and he's also a, a member of our international advisory board. Uh, David brings his business expertise to the school where he teaches Asian business and entrepreneurship. 
Uh, he also has a distinguished career in business uh, himself. He's a managing director of Ansu Partners, an investment firm that focuses on helping innovative industrial technology com companies succeed. Uh, he is also a senior advisor to the Boston Consulting Group and serves as the on the executive board of a number of uh, technology uh, firms. And so, with that, welcome. Great. I'm counting on biologics for my future health, and actually, so are you. A biologic is an engineered antibody that can work miracles. One that you might have heard of is called Humira, and Humira works by blocking a protein that would otherwise cause inflammation. And it's a wonder drug because it works on Crohn's disease, on arthritis, on psoriasis, and on a whole range of diseases. But before you can take Humira, you have to make it. And how do you make it? Well, you don't mix it like a chemical, like aspirin. You grow it in a cell. And after you grow it, you have to separate it from all of the other little things that are right there alongside it. In order to do that, you need a filter. You need a filter that's perfect at the nanoscale. And this is a picture of a perfect filter. Each hole is about 10 nanometers across. And if you had a piece of this filter the size of a quarter, it would have 80 million holes in it. And what this filter does is it blocks the Humira and keeps it on one side, and it takes all of those other contaminants and it puts them on the other side. So that when the Humira is injected into you, there's no little viral particles or other nasties that will get into your body. This filter didn't exist until about two years ago. And a young scientist named Rachel Doran at Cornell developed this filter. She's the product of a major public research university in New Mexico, did work at Sandia National Labs, went to Cornell, and with grants from the NSF and the NIH, she developed this filter. After she graduated, she left Cornell, she got some additional grants, what some of you know as SBIRs, and started a little company in Rochester, New York, called Terrapore, with some friends and family money. And then she tried to raise money, and nobody cared. We'll come back to that. I'm also counting on cell therapies. A lot of that work is taking place here. A cell therapy is where you take a human cell and you reprogram it to do something useful, like taking one of your white cells and reprogramming it to eat cancer. But before you can reprogram a cell, you actually need to sort it out. And just across the street here, a few researchers were struggling with the issue of how to sort out cells. And in kind of classic UCSD cross-disciplinary spirit, three PhDs, one in biochemistry, one in biomedical sciences, and one in material science, came together to develop a technology to sort out and isolate cells so that they could be reprogrammed. And in a garage in Sorrento Valley, they created a company called NanoSelect. So these two companies 
are really enabling our future prosperity and creating tomorrow's industries. Terrapore enables the manufacturing of biologics. NanoSelect enables medical therapies. But when these companies turned to venture capital to support them, they didn't find any interest. Instead, venture capital today <laughs> primarily is engaged in the scooter arms race or other similar arms races. There's a group behind Bird and there's a group behind Lime. Now, to me, the irony is that these venture firms are often funded by the endowments of major research universities. Uh, and to what end? So a group of us created a new firm to finance the kinds of companies that I've just told you about. Uh, we have an office in San Diego, just down the street. We have a team of four UCSD-affiliated folks working with us. We have an office in Boston, and we're investing in these types of companies across North America. We financed Terrapore when nobody else would back Rachel and her team in Rochester. And together with Illumina Ventures, we financed Jose and Will and Sung Hwan, the three young UCSD PhDs behind NanoSelect. And so far, we funded 17 other companies like them, including spin-outs of Caltech, UCSD, UC Berkeley, Cornell, Harvard, MIT, University of Minnesota, and University of Toronto. What does it take? It really takes four key things. Technical, industrial, commercial, and financial expertise to help these companies develop and commercialize their technologies. And what did we learn? We learned mainly that the system is broken. Someone comes out of a research lab with NSF and NIH grants. They then try to start up a company. They get some SBIR funding. They get some friends and family funding. But if they're not doing scooters, or they're not doing social media, or they don't have the potential of the next Uber, there's no professional capital available to help them. But what we've also learned is that there's an enormous opportunity because of the enormous technology changes coming to industry, and we plan to prosper from bringing these companies to market. Thank you. Thank you, David. It is my, my pleasure now to introduce uh, Barry Naughton. Uh, Barry is one of the world's most highly respected uh, economists working on China. He holds the Sok Wan Lok Chair of Chinese International Affairs at the school, and he leads our new Masters of Chinese Economic and Political Affairs. He is an expert on the Chinese economy, uh, especially on issues related to uh, industry, trade, finance, and China's transition to the market economy. He has uh, examined economic reform in Chinese cities, trade and trade disputes between China and the US, as well as economic interactions within China, Taiwan, uh, and Hong Kong. And he recently focused on uh, regional economic growth in China and its relationship to foreign trade and investment. So with that, I want you to join me in welcoming Barry. <laughs> China. Of course, as Gordon Hansen made clear, we've already been talking about China. Because all of the kind of technological changes and the economic changes that have been driving the issues we've been grappling with this morning are inextricably interwoven with China and China's emergence into a prominent place in the world economy. The question I want to ask today is whether China is now post-transition. What do I mean by this? If we go back 40 years, you know, all the way back to 1979, China launched into 
a transition process. China undertook something, reform and opening. And since that time, of course, the, the path hasn't been smooth. There have been ups and downs. But for sure, since that time, China launched a transformation process that has changed everything about Chinese society, Chinese economy, Chinese policy, and of course, as the speakers this morning have, have demonstrated in multiple ways, the world economy, the U.S. economy as well. And of course, everybody understands that that process led to a massive explosion of activity, a massive explosion of creativity, and a massive explosion of wealth. But beyond this economic miracle, there's another kind of, I'd call it a policy miracle, that has gone along with this fundamental economic transformation. Because one thing we can say about China from the beginning is, Chinese leaders never knew where they were going. And they knew that they didn't know what they were going. In other words, the remarkable thing about this incredible transformation, and just remember how incredible it is, right? China has grown economically faster, longer than any economy in world history, right? And yet this transformation was achieved in a context where a set of leaders were pushing for change, but didn't claim to have any particular endpoint in mind, didn't claim to have a model or a destination. So instead, Chinese policymakers over this 30 plus year period grappled with problems. Easy problems, hard problems. You know, in my many years looking at China, I've been struck by how many times outside observers have said, well, they've done the easy things, but now they have the hard task. Only to find that five or six or seven years later, that hard task had been grappled with, whether it was property rights for farmers, whether it was state-owned enterprises, whether it was financial institutions, or whether it was allowing rural people to leave the farm and come to the city. So this process in which problems were gradually identified, gradually addressed, and gradually resolved has really been a distinctive feature of the whole Chinese transition process from the very beginning. And because it's been such a distinctive feature of the transition process, these very vague terms, you know, terms like reform. What does reform mean? Opening. What does opening mean? These very, very vague terms actually have had some meaning because they were terms that made clear to many people the direction of change. They were terms that made clear to people the spirit of change. They animated a process that allowed a policy-making process to be adaptive, to be learning, to absorb characteristics of the status quo and decide, very much in the spirit of Rene, what Rene was saying, decide which features of the status quo should be at least temporarily preserved in order to maximize and allow the movement toward change and toward the future. In other words, when we think about transition in China, the successful period of transition in China, we need to think about a transition process that was powerful precisely because the content and the meaning of this transition was revealed only by the transition process itself. Now that's looking back. What about today? Well, you know, the first thing that you find when you look at China today is that everything's changed. Now, of course, part of that is just because the speed of transformation has been so rapid. So many things have changed. But looking at it as an economist, one of the things I find so striking is that the fundamental, tangible economic features of China, all those things that economists are, are pretty good at describing through numbers and, and other kinds of characterizations, those fundamental processes have changed. So, for instance, China went through its transformational miracle growth period, this structural change from an agricultural economy to an urban industrial economy. But you know what? It's done. It's over. China went through a demographic dividend where a surge of young people flooded into markets and pushed up, uh, pushed up economic growth. And you know what? It's over. China's looking around the corner now at becoming an aging society. Instead of trying to limit births, 
Now they're looking for ways to encourage kid, people to have more kids. For a long time, China was forced into market reforms because there were bottlenecks or you know, fundamental problems they couldn't resolve any other way. So they were willing to say, okay, we'll open up the structure of demand and allow the economy to go wherever, wherever it's opened up to. And now policymakers don't seem so interested in that anymore. They've decided that as they move out of this other structural transformation period, they need to tell the world what the new growth drivers are going to be. So they're publishing plans, they're publishing two or three plans a year that say we're going to be prominent in industrial robots, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, etc., etc., so that the government planners are stepping up and saying this is where we're going to drive the economy. And so this fundamental feature of transition that people didn't know where they were going seems to be being lost as government leaders increasingly feel confident that the successes of the past are telling them that they can guide into the future. And I think this is peculiar because if we think about each of these structural changes, it's true that from an economic standpoint, the structural changes have occurred and the pace of change is probably slowing down. But does that mean we don't need the same kind of transitional spirit? If we think about it, you think about the structural change, economy moves from agriculture to industry, but it doesn't stop there, does it? After an economy industrializes, it moves into the service economy. And China has all kinds of untapped potential to be a service giant, to be a, 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 an information giant, to be an art and design giant, to be a food giant, to be an enormously creative economy in all kinds of ways that are result related not to the industrial economy, but to the new emerging economies that are so important. China is aging, but as someone who's been there, believe me, the 30s and the 40s are better and more interesting than the 20s, and they require just as much creativity and just as much exploration. So one of the funny things we find about China today then is this new determination of the leadership to move away from this conception of transition that was exploratory. You know, the leader of China today, Xi Jinping, has talked about, he doesn't use the term China model, but he talks about socialism with Chinese characteristics, and he says it a, presents a road to other countries. If they want to follow this road, they can become, they can grow faster and be more self-reliant. So in other words, the Chinese leader today, the most important leader, has moved away from this exploratory sense of transition. And we see it as well in, in the way the policymakers in China, who even several years ago or a decade ago were really trying as hard as possible to elicit a kind of consultative advice on how to make policy and what they should be doing. And increasingly that's narrowing and they're less interested in hearing opinions from non-governmental organizations, from university experts, the policy process is narrower, there's more censorship in social media. That, that kind of flexibility and adaptability seems to be being reduced. So I think this is a, a bad thing, and I, I'm worried about it not just for China, but for another reason that might surprise you. And that is, I think that the world needs China to be a leader. In other words, China has its experience with engaging with change is deeper and more profound in some sense than any other country. And as we face these absolutely unprecedented sets of changes, how's the economy going to change? How's work going to change? How are, how are technologies transforming our existence? We need the engagement and creativity that China has established over the last 30 years with the transition process. You know, you hear all the time that the United States can't cope with a rising China. I don't believe it. I think if somebody tells you about the Thucydides trap and how we're destined for conflict, I'd say, look at them with a great deal of skepticism and say, is that the real, is that the main part of the story? 
because I suggest to you that it isn't the main part of the story. And I want to leave you with this paradox. China can be an important leader in the world. And the only thing that's missing is for China to abandon the idea that it already knows where we should be going. Thank you.